Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to this special online event, a fearless conversation hosted by Flinders University in Adelaide. It's part of a series of fearless conversations, and this is our first one for 2022. And our topic this evening is cancer care. Do cancer survivors get enough care? And my name is Julie McCrossan. I'm pleased to say that I am a cancer survivor. I was treated for stage four oropharyngeal cancer in my tonsils, tongue and throat uh, caused by the human papillomavirus, the HPV virus, and I was treated back in 2013. And I'm now an ambassador for Head and Neck Cancer Australia, targeting cancer and trog cancer research. And uh, perhaps most importantly, I'm a member of Cancer Voices SA, which is a, a patient and family advocacy organisation here in Adelaide. Let me begin by acknowledging uh, that we're broadcasting to you this evening on Aboriginal land, the land of the Ghana people, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present, and to say Nina Mani, uh, which is greetings in the land of in the language of the Ghana people. And of course, we're on the eve of World Cancer Day, and the theme for World Cancer Day is close the care gap. And this evening, we're going to hear from some fantastic researchers from Flinders University, talking about how they're working together, collaborating together, collaborating across disciplines in order to close the care gap and make sure that cancer survivors uh, get the care that they need, often ongoing for, for, for a number of years. Just before we welcome our panel on screen, I'd like to let you know that questions are most welcome. We have a question host, you'll meet Shortly, Dr. Matt Wallen, who's himself a researcher, he researches the effects of exercise on people living with chronic conditions. Uh, so Matt will be monitoring all your questions. You can start putting them in. You'll see a spot, I think, in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And we're going to answer as many as possible. Obviously, we won't answer them all, but we're going to record them all and they will inform the work of our researchers, but also possibly future fearless conversations. And if you're a Twitter person, uh, tonight it's hashtag fearless conversations. Well, let me welcome our panel. They're all going to pop up on screen as I speak. We should be seeing their faces at any moment. Yes, here they come. And uh, I'll give you a, a sense of who they are. I'd like to welcome Professor Ray Chan. If you could wave to us, Ray, he's the director of the Caring Futures Institute at Flinders University a professor of cancer nursing, and among many other things, an NH and MRC investigator fellow. Welcome also to Associate Professor Lisa Beatty, who I can see there with an important wall chart, uh, a professor of clinical psychology at Flinders University, and a visiting consulting clinical psychologist in medical oncology at Flinders Medical Centre. So welcome to you. Welcome also to Professor Bogda Koswara, a medical oncologist with 25 years experience, hi Bogda, a senior staff specialist and she at the Flinders Medical Centre and she leads survivorship research at the Flinders Health and Medical Research Institute. So I'm just going to do, uh, this is deaf sign clapping and even if you're at home and we can't see you, uh, feel free to do that as well so that you feel you're connected to us. Um, and I'd like to welcome now Vicky Bedford who is the chair of Cancer Voices SA, the advocacy organisation, the mother of Zoe, who is a cancer survivor, and Vicky is also a, a research support person, consumer engagement at the Flinders Health and Medical Research Institute. So welcome to you, Vicky. I, I thought we'd begin by, you know, grounding our, our deep dive into Flinders research in the lived experience, as they say, of, of a mother. Uh, a mother of Zoe. Can you tell us just a little bit about how, you know, you and Zoe, the, the, the cancer journey that you've had, and I guess the impact of that long term uh, and the need for ongoing care for Zoe. Welcome. Thank you, Julie. Thanks for having me. Um, it's my daughter, Zoe. She was diagnosed when she was two years old with um, a severe Ewing sarcoma tumour on her spinal cord. Um, 
it was quite a, a journey for us. We had nine months of chemotherapy, five weeks of proton therapy radiation. Um, and she was considered cured after nine months, which is amazing. And she's now 15 years old. And over the last 13 years, we've had quite the journey of, of the side effects that happen due to those treatments, um, ranging from minor things, um, some dental surgeries, you know, teeth not forming properly, um, down to her, she's had some major spine surgeries just recently over the last six months, we've had um, a, a big series of surgeries that have happened um, and she's doing quite well, but we just, we are always under surveillance and trying to manage those, those lasting side effects. And I should say for people that the proton therapy was in the United States. Uh, um, uh, and of course, proton therapy is coming to Australia here in uh, in Adelaide uh, at the Bragg Centre for Proton Therapy and Research, which they're building at the moment. But just to explain how you've managed to have proton therapy, you know, it, I I think it will be a surprise to some people viewing that the the impact of cancer treatment can go from the age of two through to the age of fifteen. Uh, it's more common, I think, with young children, but in your involvement as the chair of Cancer Voices SA, how common have you found it that people need support beyond the curative treatment that they may be lucky enough to get? Oh, we see it all the time. Most of our members who are off treatment, um, ranging from a couple of days off treatment to years, they're, they're finding, um, one of the major things we're finding right now is some cardiovascular issues, um, that have developed due to some of the chemotherapy drugs um, and also some of the lifestyle because we're we're finding those patients are at higher risk afterwards of some of the things that wouldn't normally have affected them. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of different things that, that people have. Children tend to have more like fertility issues or um, it, and there's so much that isn't known. And you don't know which person's going to develop which side effect. So um, it's really important for us to make sure that we're educating people afterwards and staying under surveillance in a way that's not traumatic to people, but that still enables them to, to get checked regularly and prevent anything that we can. Well, look, Vicky, thanks for, for kicking us off. And we're going to come back to you to get a sense of the two or three things that have really helped you in these years after uh, Zoe's initial treatment and also areas that you think could be improved. Uh, but let me come now to uh, Professor Bogda Koswara, you'll remember our medical oncologist. Can you give us a, a sense, Bogda, of, you know, the question we've been given is, do cancer survivors get enough care? What's your answer to that? And what's the evidence to back up your answer? Thanks, Julie. The answer is not yet. And the evidence is taken directly from the research that we have conducted here at Flinders when we took a very simple tool and one page questionnaire that we've incorporated into clinical consultation that our cancer nurse coordinators undertake in patients with different types of cancer. So breast cancer, head and neck cancer, lung cancer. And when we asked patients what symptoms they might have, and there were nine symptoms to choose from, and perhaps do they have any other problems, whether they are pra practical, financial, uh, spiritual. We have learned that when you ask, three quarters of the patients had problems, a quarter of those who did have problems had severe problems that required addressing, um, and on average, people had about four problems that they needed addressing. The good news is that when we identified those problems, they were relatively easy to address. But the key was we needed to recognize that there were issues to address. And we do not yet do that work routinely. So we know that there are needs that need to be addressed and symptoms that need to be managed. And the gap that we're trying to address is between asking questions, which should be the ideal care, and not asking and therefore not knowing. You know, I, I, I asked Bogda to send me the questionnaire that the nurses uh, submitted to all these patients in the research she's just referred to. And I almost wept when I saw it because it listed so many things that touched my heart as a cancer survivor. 
you, you've had a passion for survivorship. I think you began the first uh, conference. At, uh, you've been an international leader in this field of so-called survivorship. It's thank you to Vicky for some deaf sign clapping there. Um, why were you affected so deeply by this need to address the post-curative care? Because as a patient, I have to be honest with you, we tend to be followed up really intensely for five years and then we're let free from the home base of the hospital. And I have the sense that many cancer teams feel under pressure just to meet the needs for those five years. So it must be not an easy sell to say, no, we need to care for people longer. So how did you get gripped by this vision about survivorship? Well, I'm very grateful to be an oncologist because as an oncologist, you learn that life is precious and rich and wonderful. And you learn that because you know that uh, the good life doesn't last forever. That's the first lesson you learn in oncology. So you learn to appre appreciate every single day. But you then realize that life is much more than the tumor. And I think that the success of cancer therapy is completely uh, achieved as a result of single-minded focus on shrinking and eradicating the tumor. But that's not life in its entirety. And survivors, as Vicky had indicated, realize that there is more to their experience of living a rich life after the treatment is finished, when they can go back to their hobbies, their families, their interests. And I always aspired to, for my goal to be ensuring that people can have that rich life as opposed to just disappearance of tumour from the scan. And, you know, um, Vicky mentioned the cardiovascular concerns of her daughter, and I know that's something Vicky's very keen to hear more about. And that is a, a key discovery of your research because of your collection of patient reported outcomes that when patients are given a form like this they get to tell you comprehensively what's happened you believe that patient reported outcomes are critical could you talk to both the need for patient reported outcomes but also this cardiovascular risk discovery because there will be patients what listening tonight who may not have heard of this before because I certainly hadn't. So perhaps let's start with cardiovascular disease because Vicky sort of highlighted that as an important issue and our research here in South Australia allowed us to analyze the causes of death in people who survive cancer long term and we managed to look at the data from the entire state of South Australia and what we have found is that in comparison to people without cancer, people who do have history of cancer are more likely to die of cardiovascular disease. And that is a finding across all cancer types. So it is not just treatments, cancers that are treated with to cardiotoxic drugs, but also cancers like skin cancer, for example, which makes me think that one of the potential explanations might be that patients not being aware of this as a risk, may prioritize cancer care, but not prioritize care for other conditions um, because they just do not know that that is the risk. So uh, in order to address this problem, we need to educate patients and we need to give them an opportunity to recognize what's important to them as a whole, which brings me to this question of patient reported outcomes and self-management. And I think we need to appreciate that patients have their own view of what's important for them at any given time. For some, it might be the cancer. For others, it might be financial difficulties. For others, it might be the diabetes that makes them disabled or unwell. If we want to be helpful, we have to start by asking what matters to you. But we have to ask in a sort of systematic way in such a way that we do it every time and we ask similar questions and in such a way that we can say well actually we've discovered that patients with lung cancer have more problems with shortness of breath and therefore that's what we need to address for them and that is really 
where patient reported outcomes as captured on this piece of paper that you have shown us, Julie, are, they are a very good tool of systematic way of addressing patients' needs. And it's a dirt cheap tool, pencil and paper will suffice, and it is available in most languages around the world. I fear it's probably not yet available in the written Aboriginal languages, that's a work to be done, but I know that we borrowed heavily from Canadian experience and you can pick any language in, including Antarctic languages. So simple tool, incredibly effective. Look, thank you. And if you've just joined us, this is a fearless conversation and we're asking cancer care, do cancer survivors get enough care? I, I want to, and if, please put your questions in. I'll be coming to Matt, our question host, uh, shortly to get uh, some audience questions. If I may come now to Professor Ray Chan, Director of the Caring Futures Institute at Flinders University and a Professor of Cancer Nursing. You know, I made reference there, uh, Ray, earlier to the pressure that cancer teams can feel under just to deal well in that five-year period for those of us lucky enough to survive and reach the five years and then we tend to be let go. But you've come up with, uh, through your research, and I think you've been working in uh, a number of cancers, breast cancer, lymphoma, prostate cancer, and uh, looking forward in neuroendocrine tumours. You've been looking at, at an integrated model involving general practitioners. Can you tell us what's What's your vision for this model? What do you hope it will achieve uh, so that people will dare to ask cancer survivors what they're actually experiencing and hopefully deal with it? Welcome. Surely, thank you for the question. I, I think that it is uh, important to reflect um, upon some of the issues that patients face um, when they um, when they have received um, after they received their treatment, and and some of them could be pain, fatigue, uh, sleep disturbance, um, sexuality concerns, financial concerns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What we need to know is that in the acute cancer centre. It is not it is not um, necessarily uh, the best environment to actually meet those needs of patients. It is oftentimes a very fast-paced um, environment whereby people come in, they see the oncologist, they check that they're cancer-free, and then off you go. Um, what my dream really is uh, in my career is that I really want to see that there would be um, a shared care model that will be readily available, just as common as the antenatal care model, that a woman who rock up to the GP, they know that they have the confidence that there are protocols and their information, there is connections and communication between um, between the maternity services and the GP. Similarly, my vision is that across Australia, there will be the, there will be the system and coordination to give cancer survivors the confidence that they can get their best care um, in, in primary care in the community. It's a, it's a fantastic vision. Now, as you know, I have a daughter who's a young GP and I can hear her uh, saying things, business model, item number, Help, help me understand how this will be, obviously there will be the issue of the cancer team communicating more effectively, but let's go to the financial side first. Explain to us how you will make it financially viable for GPs to be truly integrated into the cancer team and in the survivorship period. Sure. And what I would first highlight uh, as a little bit of a plug, um, Julie, is that at the Caring Futures Institute, we are true believers of co-design and engaging with end users that in a way that we don't just do research by just with researchers, but we actually co-design solutions with patients and end users. And in this particular model, in this particular plan and dream that I have, I co-designed these um, interventions with GPs, with patients, with primary care providers. And one thing that came up very, very, very early stage is that we have to make sure that our, uh, uh, the GP colleagues are well um, and actually uh, appropriately reimbursed. And so what we have actually found is that everyone here, um, we, we are aware it's very, very difficult to just 
keep creating new reinvestment items for um, for general general practitioners. But what we have been able to do is to find those existing ones and actually make it possible for the GPs to claim in looking after the patients in the survivorship phase. So when we actually connect patients up with the GPs, we actually tell the practice managers, we tell the GPs, these are the items that you can claim if you are engaged in this care. So it is still a, a longer term journey that we want to expand more items, potentially items that are more appropriate for cancer survivors. But the ones that are out there, they're actually quite sufficient if we use it. And if we have a nurse who can actually do the communication and engage the GPs and actually tell them what the business model is, um, that is half the better one. What will be the benefits to patients if you achieve this? And I, I know you do active research in different areas of cancer, but in a nutshell, the benefits to patients. Well, um, there are many benefits, but um, the first one and the key one is that in a shared care model, you actually get the best expertise from the best appropriate person. So you're getting your, your specialist cancer care from your oncologist and from your cancer nurses or from the other specialists who are in the acute care setting, but you are actually accessing the wealth of knowledge. And what the GPs are really good at is that they, they look at the entire holistic picture. So some of the issues that Bogda has talked about, about cardiovascular care, um, GPs are experts of that. They know how to actually assess risk. They know how to manage your blood pressure accordingly. They know how to refer you to the dietitians and exercise physiologists that you need um, in, in the community. So, so it is not even, is it actually an, um, uh, an, an optimal or is it actually preferred? Um, if you actually ask people, are you going to, are you going to um, uh, an orthopedic surgeon to check out your bones? Are you going to um, a, cardio, a cardiovascular heart um, doctor to check out your heart? Similarly, I would say that cancer survivors who have got a marate of issues, we re they really need to have a good general practitioner who can be their overall care provider. There's a lot of nodding. I want to encourage you to do deaf sign clapping. It's a tremendous skill and it looks good on the camera. And there are some invisible Flinders University people backstage. If you could take photos uh, with your iPhones, we'd be most grateful. Look, I, Lisa Beatty, I want you to know I care about distress and psychosocial well-being more than anyone on earth. But I, exercise physiology has been mentioned. I think I'll go, invite onto the screen Matt Wallen, Dr. Matt Wallen, who's an exercise physiologist. He's going to do a few press-ups for us. Where are you, Matt? Hi, Matt. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Now, Matt is our question host. Uh, can you bring us one of the questions from the audience, please? Yeah, Joe, we've had, we've had a, a lot of questions, some really interesting ones as well. Um, one of the questions that sort of came around, or the themes that are coming around is to do with the, the care that happens in metropolitan um, centres. Are people sort of going to be able to access this type of work in rural and remote areas? And that was sort of a question towards the whole panel. Wow, golly. Um, I, I might come to Ray first, if I may. The rural and remote question for survivorship care, and just reminding our audience, we are talking about that at the non-acute period. Have you done some work in your research so far where you've gone outside of a major centre? I know you have been working in Brisbane, you're now in Adelaide. Your response to this, this critical question of access, equity of access. Yeah, absolutely, Julie. Indeed, um, that is another very, very fundamental reason of why we need to engage primary care providers. Because what happens is that the acute cancer centres are oftentimes located in major cities or actually in regional centres, but even the regional centres are not providing all the services either, all the services are greater. So it is very, very important that we engage and empower the local primary care providers. And the benefit to patients is that they don't have to travel 50 Ks, 90 Ks, and actually see an oncologist for five minutes to say that you're cancer free, but actually, you know what, I don't have time to look after your fatigue, your sexual issues, um, and some of the other financial problems you want to, you know, I, I just don't basically have the time for that. Can I come to you, uh, Bogda, our medical oncologist, I'm interested in how you respond to this question about rural and remote access and how it fits with the vision 
Ray has put forward for survivorship care because as a cancer survivor, I did want my radiation oncologist and my surgeon to check me out as well as the dealing with those other chronic care issues that we that may emerge after I fill out my questionnaire. So help me understand for rural and remote people how the cancer team will uh, link to the GP-led uh, uh, follow-up option. So to follow up from Ray's summary, it is not either or. The power is in the connection between the two. Uh, so we do not want GPs to be mini oncologists and patients saying, well, I do not want to have a mini oncologist. I want to have a real oncologist. Equally so, we do not want oncologists to be mini GPs who can uh, try to manage high blood pressure, but they really don't do it very often. There is a real power and skill that is relevant to a particular specialty. And I would imagine your daughter, Julie, will tell you that a general practitioner is a specialist in general medicine. I certainly appreciate that a lot of health concerns that my patients have are general medical concerns. Um, and they are better addressed by GPs. The trick is we need to connect the dots. The power and perhaps one of the solutions is in using technology to make that connection. And this is something where I would need to dob in Lisa because she's an expert in using technology to overcome tyranny of distance. Look, thank you so much, Bogdra. And let me uh, reintroduce Associate Professor Lisa Beattie, a Professor of Clinical Psychology at Flinders University and a visiting consulting clinical psychologist in medical oncology at Flinders Medical Centre, which is a great big hospital. I'm new to Adelaide, so it's Flinders Medical Centre is a great big hospital. Lisa, I, I had the word telehealth and internet screaming in my head uh, because I have spent a lot of time in rural and remote Australia. I want to ask you more about mental health in a moment, but specifically rural and remote people. What's your vision there for survivorship care? Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways, one of the silver linings that's come out of the delights of COVID over the last two years is it's actually made telehealth far more mainstream than it has ever been before. Um, and people are now more familiar and willing to, to give it a try. Um, and it's also, you know, from a Medicare point of view, far more um, massively available than it ever has been. And I think that really is actually helping to overcome some of those access and inequity of access problems that um, people who were living in rural or are living in rural and remote areas have um, historically faced. I guess the only caveat to that um, as a word of not trying to be a downer, but um, I do know that sometimes internet speed and um, you know connectivity can still be a little bit of a problem for those uh, living in rural and remote areas. So that's you know there's still some work to be done, but on the positive side, I think there's there's far better access now than there ever has been historically. And, and this question of distress, what does mm. the evidence tell us? is about the proportion of cancer survivors who have significant distress, who really do need extra assistance. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really um, important point to make that a lot of um, people, when they first think about cancer, they, they don't necessarily think about the psychological impact. But we know that um, approximately one third out of all people when they're first diagnosed with cancer, um, will experience what we call clinically significant distress. And that's the kind of distress where it's impacting on their ability to do their day-to-day -day lives, um, or it's, it's severe enough that it's um, really impairing their enjoyment of life as well. Um, and I mean, that's a really sizable percentage and it's much higher than in the general community. Um, and the other thing to really note there is it's not something that just goes away. Um, it does quite often need treatment. Um, and we know that it's similar to what Bogda was saying earlier, it doesn't tend to be screened for frequently enough. And even when it is screened, it doesn't tend to be treated um, in the way it should be. There are enormous barriers to access to psychological support. Can you just list them in a nutshell for us to alert people to this? What are the barriers? Okay, so I think roughly there's four. So I hope I remember all four of them off the top of my head. But the first one is there's a workforce shortfall. So there is a far bigger demand for psychological care and psychosocial care um, than there are clinicians available to actually meet that need. 
Um, so that's the first barrier. The second barrier, as we've already talked about, is for those living in rural and remote areas, um, you know, trying to actually get to a, a place where there is actually a psychologist available to provide care or a mental health clinician, it doesn't have to be a psychologist. Um, you know, for those, there's actual geographic barriers that um, can really lead to some barriers there. Uh, the third barrier would be uh, illness related. There are plenty of people who are actually experiencing significant um, side effects, are quite unwell from their, their actual medical treatment and from the cancer itself. And the idea of adding yet another appointment that they have to attend a hospital for um, can actually be one barrier too many and it makes them feel like it's just too much. Uh, and then the last barrier, which is not the least, is actually about personal preferences, that it's actually not everyone's cup of tea to go and see a mental health clinician. Um, and that there's still, despite all the inroads that we're trying to make, there can still be a real stigma around um, seeing a mental health clinician. So people would rather um, have the preference of doing it by themselves in their own time, in the privacy of their own home, um, or not see anyone at all. Look, Lisa, I'm going to come back to you to, to hear more about the resources that you've developed and some of it in uh, collaboration with Bogda, a, a feature of the Flinders community. But I want to get Matt, our exercise physiologist, to come back and uh, uh, bring us another question, if he would. Matt, can you give us a sense of any other themes that are emerging and share a question with us, please? Yeah, there's, there's a few themes. I think, um, Bogda, you're quite famous with your questionnaire, so you're going to have to be sending that to everyone by, at the end of this, by the sounds of it. Um, I think one of the ones which I suppose is more um, contemporary is around, um, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way that cancer care and cancer survivorship moves in, into the future. And people are sort of wanting to know, you know, what are some of the silver linings that we could learn from what we've gone through over the last um, uh, couple of years? And what are some of the problems that need to be overcome, uh, I suppose, following the pandemic as well? Thank you. Can I ask each of you to say a couple of things? Uh, can I start with you, Ray? Uh, silver linings, uh, just one or two out of uh, what's this amazing international pandemic with, you know, let's acknowledge some great distress with death and illness and long COVID, but are there silver linings in the sense of change within the health system? Look, Julie, I think one of the silver linings is that we are a lot more aware of the care gaps. Um, in the healthcare system. Not that we were not aware of them before, but during COVID, we actually further highlight them and actually giving us a little bit of a nudge um, to the healthcare community that we might have to actually really, really solve it. And in the, in the um, sort of area of shared care and actually uh, collaborating with primary care to, to provide more sustainable care, what we have really found out is that um, a number of cancer patients are not our cancer survivors are not able to return to their cancer center for care, mainly because of um, the, the, the um, uh, really, really high demand of care in the, in the cancer center. And therefore, um, uh, there are way more things that we need to do to look at how we can make care more sustainable. And that's only one of the care gap that we have highlighted and identified during COVID. And could I just quickly say, because uh, when we mentioned rural and remote, we didn't mention transport and accommodation. And uh, I've been uh, uh, facilitating discussions in rural and remote areas for years and just plain old transport and accommodation and poverty, to be blunt with you, stops an enormous amount of access to care. So I just wanted to put that out there because we hadn't yet mentioned it. Bob, do any silver lining, some shifts that you think, oh, there's an opportunity here out of COVID? Oh, yes. And there are two. And I think they we've witnessed them, but we need to pay attention to them for the future. The first one is when uh, when the things when things get tough, the change can happen overnight. Some of you may remember that we went from no telemedicine to telemedicine in March 2020, just like that. So if things need to be done, we need to remember that for the future things that we need desperately, they could be delivered overnight if required. The second, which connects to that, is sometimes they disappear overnight just as well. And what is quite heartening is that the power of advocacy of, of passionate consumers and clinicians can make a change. Recently, we saw phone consultations disappear from the reimbursement schedule, and there was a significant sort of pushback from 
uh, a range of advocates, including Clinical Oncology Society of Australia, and just like that, they reappeared. So I think we need to remember that we are each and every one are responsible for advocacy to make a change because change can happen if you speak up. If there's one thing that I would want to remember from today, that's it. Listen, I'm going to come to Vicky Bedford, if I may, and I'll come back to you, Lisa, in a moment, uh, because Vicky is uh, the mother of a cancer survivor, if you've just joined us, uh, and also uh, the chair of Cancer Voices SA, uh, which is an advocacy group for patients and their families. Vicky, I, 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 I just want to, first of all, give you the opportunity to say, is there any shift you've seen during COVID that you would like to note? Because I think uh, Bogda's comments are very pertinent. This pandemic is a bit like war. There's tremendous innovation in war. Women weren't allowed to fly aeroplanes, but in the Second World War, we flew aeroplanes everywhere. Uh, and then straight after the war, they stopped us being pilots. So you can get it and you can lose it. But is there any positive before I ask you some other questions? Any positive? Yeah, I, I, I have to agree with um, Bogda. And I think I've seen uh, from the consumer side of things, the there's a tremendous uptake now and, and a realization of the value that consumers bring to to research to healthcare change and to policy changes as well so i think that the the power imbalance that used to be there is is finally changing and, and evolving and just like tonight we are we're including my voice as the consumer side of things where this maybe last year might not have happened Thank you. Um, so I, I think that that's a real shift that we need to take advantage of. And I think because of the telehealth options and the, the team's options even, a lot more consumers that may have been more reluctant to go in person to attend a meeting with some powerful people who are very brilliant and may have been more intimidated. I think they're now stepping up and realizing they can take these steps and participate um, online and in other ways rather than face-to-face. -face. I, I want to go to the, some of the uh, reflections on your direct experience as the mother of Zoe treated for cancer at two and now 15. But just before I do that, just in a nutshell, your role at Flinders in consumer engagement, just explain that because you believe that's a very important initiative that others could emulate, don't you? Absolutely. I think um, Flinders and the, the Health and Medical Research Institute has, has made a big, big push to, to create this position that I'm sitting in. And it's for consumer engagement. And it's about connecting researchers to consumers and consumers to researchers. And it's part of my role is to help teach researchers how to engage with consumers and how to do that in a meaningful way. And less transactional and more relationship building. And so I think that the, the, the way that they've done this is, is so great. And I'm, I'm so grateful for the, the role and the opportunity because I think it shows that they really are committed to embedding the voice throughout research from the very beginning. Like, like Ray mentioned at the very beginning, co-design, he, he actually comes and he is asking all the stakeholders, not just the other doctors or other researchers, and I'm finding more collaborations across disciplines, um, across um, like you're seeing, you know, Lisa from psychology and Ray in nursing and Bogda, like this co-design across multiple fields and disciplines, I think is a real boon for all of us. It's just gonna better everything later. Look, I, I, thank you so much for that. And I, now I just wanna ask you some direct questions. Remember our question tonight is cancer care. Do cancer survivors get enough care? So I, I, I want to ask you, Vicky, two or three things that have really helped you support Zoe from two to 15 with significant side effects of her childhood cancer treatment. And I think the first thing you want to talk about is surveillance. It, it, what, what does that mean and why has that helped? Um, I think for, it kind of has two purposes for me. And at, at the very onset of diagnosis, they sat us down and when they were telling us what um, our daughter had, and what it was about to, to become of our life, they gave us some hope by saying, you know, that here's a chance that she's gonna get cured and she's gonna be a healthy, somewhat normal child. And so you need to, to remember that you're going to have life after cancer. And that gave us a lot of hope 
but they also showed us the importance of maintaining that surveillance because there are chances of side effects happening. Um, and at the time, this was 13 years ago, at the time, they were only just starting to understand that there was some cardiovascular issues that could um, be detected early within with blood work. Um, and at that point, it was more about the, the cardiovascular um, problems that would happen due to the chemotherapy. It wasn't about lifestyle at that point. And so uh, it was really, really ingrained in us from the very beginning that even though you're gonna leave us for acute treatment, it's really important that you stay in touch. It's really important that you come back at all those points year after year. It's scary and it's anxiety inducing, but it's very, very important for her long-term health and well-being. And just remind us for people who may have joined us a little late, the nature of the cancer that your daughter had it too. So she had a Ewing sarcoma tumor on her T6 vertebrae that was wrapped around her spine and was pushing out against her heart and lungs as well. Okay. And just tell us how she is now, because it's so, so challenging, doesn't it? So just how's she going now? I know she's had recent surgery. She's been in ICU, but how is she? Yep. So um, 13 days ago, uh, two weeks tomorrow, it will be um, her last surgery that she had, uh, another fusion from the front. And she is, I'm happy to report, she did a 5K walk earlier this week and she had her hydrotherapy session last night where she just smashed all her goals. <laughs> and I was doing this from the sideline. Um, she can breathe better and, and yeah, there's just, it's a significant change from where she was a year ago. But that surgery is still a result, of, it's an impact of the treatment, it's connected to the treatment. That's you know, yep. the critical message. Look, you say another thing that really helped you were written resources. And, and there, you've often mentioned these when I've spoken to you. So what were those resources and what was so good about them? Uh, I think the best part was it kept me off Google. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm the one to, to research and I always tell people double check and make sure you're, you're, you're getting the right information. But Google can put you in a very scary hole um, and there, it's not always right, as we've learned through this pandemic. I think that's another big thing we've learned is misinformation is out there. And if you want to find an answer, a specific answer, you can find it if you look hard enough. So um, the written resources that the doctors gave us at the beginning and throughout her journey was, it was really important because one, it was, I knew it was valid. I knew it was, it had been checked and, and made sure that this was exactly correct. Um, and it laid it out in a nice way that a lot of times I was taking notes throughout the meetings and it would be two o'clock in the morning when I was sitting by her bed, completely panicked for some reason and I needed to do something else. I could pick up those resources and I could look at them and read them and really kind of write down my own questions later. And it, it prompted questions for us as well as just really help support our needs for information. And I know not everybody wants a bunch of information. And I think it's really important, like Bogda said, ask the patient what they want and what they need. But having that there was really helpful for us. And they just very concisely, because I want to get to uh, back to our audience shortly, but they gave you different categories of severity of side effects. And you found that very positive, didn't you? Oh, it was brilliant. Um, each drug was um, in big bold letters at the top of the page and it was three columns of side effects that were likely, less likely and rare but serious. So that way we knew what to look out for each time, like she was on a cycle of three drugs and then two drugs. And each time I had the three that we were gonna be going and giving her and I knew what to look out for. So I knew what kind of things to look, it was gonna be a rash for this one or her teeth might hurt on that one. So it just gave me some reassurance that I, I had something tangible to do as a parent to know what I was looking for for her. And the third area was uh, access to psychological support that was specific to the needs of Zoe. Just speak to that. What was good, what was good about what you were given? Because it goes to Lisa's reference to the significant proportion of people you know, with significant distress. Yeah, with Zoe, because she's been through so many doctors and, and clinicians over the years, finding a psychologist has been really difficult. Um, and finding a psychologist who understands medical trauma 
Um, Cause there's a lot of different traumas and, and needs for psychology out there, but specifically for medical trauma and to understand the nuances of um, just, it, it was a very minor thing delving into her sleep pattern had been disrupted at a really early age. And just over the last two years is when we actually realized that was actually causing and, and creating bigger anxiety for her. So she didn't need anti-anxiety drugs. She only needed to learn how to sleep properly again, get her sleep cycle back on track. And that's something I think is really important. There may be simpler solutions than just um, an antidepressant or something, but talking it through and finding somebody who understood those nuances of medical trauma was really important for us. Look, Vicky, thank you. I'll come back to you before we finish for your summary of issues where we need improvement. But let's uh, come back to Matt and get a, another question from our audience, please. I want him to do a, a push-up because he's an exercise physiologist. <laughs> I, do more than I do more than push-ups, Julia. I can, I can assure you of that. <laughs> um, I think one of the ones that was really interesting um, uh, that someone brought up was around you know, there's some great clinical trials out there that have um, shown some really positive results around cancer survivorship. Um, how do we make sure that these initiatives and clinical trials, the results from these trials, actually translated into clinical practice to have more benefits for, for, um, for um, patients and survivors? Lisa, let me bring you in because I saw your facial expression. This is the holy grail, isn't it? Is, won't we all work for this until the day we die? I want, I want one action from each of you. What's going to make it happen? Rapid research. If I translation into practice, if I hear 10 years, it takes one more time. I didn't know if I was going to be there in 10 years when I had cancer. So how do we get it quicker into translation? Lisa, tell us, tell us psychology. <laughs> Um, I can tell you that Bob is actually one of the experts in terms of uh, what's called implementation science. But um, I think one of the things is actually you design it as an implementation study, um, this is what it's called from the get go. So, and part of this comes down to co-design again. If you actually develop these trials with end users, whether it's um, you know cancer survivors and their families and also healthcare professionals, and you actually embed it within the hospital setting from the get go and you get clinicians and cancer consumers to advocate and champion for it, um, as you're running the trial, it's far more likely than to continue. It's like a, just a, a continuum that it just gets then translated into practice at the conclusion of the trial. Ray Chan, can I come to you? This um, neuroendocrine tumours work you're going to do, nurse-enabled shared care model with general practitioners, how are you going to get that research and the results and make it happen in many GP cancer team connections? Sure. Julie, um, neuroendocrine tumour is a relatively rare cancer, so um, the specialist cancer care um, are normally um, given um, across the country, but actually mainly in the centres of excellence. So um, th th there is a high need for us to make sure that our model is sustainable and that is far-reaching to people who don't even live in those major cities. So. Um, uh, like what Lisa said, I think through the co-design um, process, we have also uh, engaged and actually partnered with um, Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia, um, who is that national um, efficacy and uh, professional body um, who actually house specialist nurses who can actually assist um, people nationally. So once again, having the end game in mind, not just actually focusing on what we are doing with the patient right there and then in the single interaction, but engineering and thinking through co-designing what needs to happen at the policy level, what does mm. it, what really needs to happen at the system level, um, can that national body really reach everyone via telehealth or do we have to get people to travel? Having all those things in mind rather than just doing a trial that actually would have to stop after the funding finish. It's so interesting. I want to seduce you because you're involved with something called the Unmet Need Grant Scheme and I want to seduce you away from neuroendocrine tumours when you finish and come over to head and neck cancer and help help my uh, cancer cohorts and colleagues. But Bogda, you're the expert. Let me come to you now. How do we improve implementation rapidly? So the bad news and the good news First, the bad news, and that is that it takes more than one solution. 
Mm. It's in contrast to efficacy clinical trials when you're testing whether the drug works or not, which is very linear, one drug, one, one CAT scan and you're done. Implementation trials, you have to try a variety of things. You're targeting uh, payers, survivors, ad administrators, clinicians, patients, etc. That's the bad news. But the good news is never underestimate the power of advocacy of people affected by the problem you're trying to fix. And the fact is, it's the people who are cancer survivors for whom this is such an important topic. You've just told us, Julie, how important head and neck cancer is to you. And if we want to improve psychosocial care or implement patient reported outcome questionnaires, or improve cardiovascular care, we need to go to people who are directly affected by it and say, stand with us and let's ask for change of politicians, of policymakers, of funders, because it is the voice of cancer survivors that matters, not the voice of people who are healthcare providers. Together, we can make a change. It's the together, Bogda. It's both, if I may yes. say, it both it's the power of us together the power of a mother advocating for her child will touch the heart even of people in treasury uh, with the difficult job mm. of rationing our tax dollars but can i just come uh, if i may to lisa Beatty, our uh, clinical psychologist uh, you, you've got a number of resources and i don't want to 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 leave our conversation without mentioning you've got healthy living after cancer as a website Finding My Way. Just tell us about these online resources you've developed, I think involved with Bogda as well. Just give us it in a nutshell, what the value of these kind of resources in terms of helping people after their treatment to recover fully and deal with the side effects. Yeah, so these resources came about partly because of the access barriers that I was describing earlier. And we know that one of the ways that people, or that we can address some of the barriers in terms of the illness barriers that might prevent people from attending appointments, as well as the personal preferences and stigma barriers, um, was to develop resources that people could access in their own time from the comfort of their own home um, and, and do it in a way that's what we call self-directed. So they can um, really self-manage their own psychosocial needs. So we went online um, and we did it before it kind of became trendy since COVID. So <laughs> we've been doing it for a really long time. Um, and we developed Finding My Way way back in, I think it was 2013. Um, and it's, we've, it's been tested through a, a clinical trial around the country. It's designed to cover the most commonly experienced issues um, and concerns that happen from the point of diagnosis onwards, because we often think about, and we've been talking about post-treatment survivorship, but we also know that if you actually start to address some of these um, issues at the point from diagnosis onwards, we can head off some of these things from occurring after. So we like to look at it from the point of treatment onwards as well. Um, and yeah, covering off on things like um, distress, on um, changes that might happen in people's social networks, on how to manage some of those physical symptoms and side effects using behavioural strategies. Um, we really do try and provide all these, uh, a lot of information as well as strategies that people can try themselves to really manage their symptoms. So that's what the Finding My Way program is about. Um, and we went online because people can do exactly what I said of managing it in the, the privacy of their own home um, and at their own time and space. The other program, Healthy Living After Cancer, is a brand new one um, that's just a brand new cab off the ranks and that's been done in partnership with Cancer Council um, South Australia and that's very much targeting the post-treatment survivorship phase um, of looking at a little bit of secondary prevention as well about trying to actually get some um, healthy eating, um, physical activity and also looking after the psychosocial concerns that really particularly arise after treatment has finished. Um, and looking at can we actually reduce or improve well-being in a more holistic way rather than just focusing on weight and shape. And can I just say one thing? My, my one concern is this five-year cutoff that seems to happen uh, like from the moment we begin because I can tell you I'm at nine years since treatment, you know, thank God, um, but I'm only now beginning to grapple with some of the both physical and psychological impacts um, you know, I won't go into personal things now, but 
can we let go of this five year, which is just an arbitrary moment, isn't it? Absolutely. And we know that some of the issues actually continue, you know, they can be enduring for years and years afterwards. Um, yeah, and things like one of the most commonly reported issues for people after they've finished their treatment for cancer is the fear of the cancer coming back. And it doesn't matter whether that's been two days after treatment's finished or 20 years after the treatment's finished, living with that risk and, and worry about it is something that will actually be there for the rest of their lives. Look, I, we've only got five minutes left, uh, ladies and gentlemen and everyone, and thank you for, for joining us for this conversation, Cancer Care, Do Cancer Survivors Get Enough Care? I want to come back to Vicki Bedford, uh, a mother of a 15-year-old survivor of cancer treatment when Zoe was two. I, I got a list from you of things uh, that you think needs to improve, and we don't have time for all of them. I'm going to read them out, and you choose one that you want to hone in on. You believe it would be good that there uh, were separate services away from the acute treatment space so that when Zoe goes back for months and years after treatment, she isn't uh, directly in the same space as children and young people in acute care. You want exercise physiologists uh, are more readily available. We'll get Matt back on in a moment to do some <laughs> clapping because um, Matt, the question man, is a, an exercise physiologist. But you want more exercise physiologists available because there are many gyms that cannot welcome cancer people. They're a bit concerned. Uh, you want cancer-specific mental health services away from the cancer team because of the many particular issues like sleep uh, disruption, post-traumatic experiences and so on and something you've mentioned close to my heart dental health and financial toxicity if you mention dental health I'll give you a second there's a deal <laughs> okay well then I'll mention dental health uh, that's been a big one for us it's very expensive and um, it was unexpected because everything looked fine um, she had the radiation during um, baby teeth so they fell out the new ones came in and the development, it was they were malformed. So there was nothing structurally wrong except for a small pieces. Um, and she ended up having a massive dental surgery and thousands and thousands of dollars. And it was a specialist dentist you have to go to that's private only. And it's just, it's very, very expensive to manage that. So yes, please incorporate that more into survival this, this care. Is, this is the failure to include dental care in Medicare, our publicly funded system in Australia, because we'll have some international viewers to this. And uh, obviously I'm close to the heart of a head and neck cancer patient because we get radiation there. Dry mouth uh, causes great damage to the teeth. It's a huge issue. And, uh, you know, I guess we call upon people for some advocacy for cancer specific public funding to dentistry. So which other issue would you now like to go for as I pushed you into dentistry? <laughs> Um, my, and my big one is that separate space. Survivorship clinics dedicated to a more holistic approach um, away from that acute center of care where like my daughter um, just recently went back last year for her surveillance and she was re-traumatized. And for about two weeks afterwards, she had some sleep issues. She had some heightened anxiety and she didn't even get treated in that center, but it's that that noticing the, the the needles and the injections, the infusions and things all around her just heightened the anxiety. And then she started worrying again, oh, is it coming back? This is why I'm back here again. So I think it's it's a really big push. And I know um, in Sydney, they've got a survivorship clinic and they include the exercise physios. So I just, I really feel like we we take it away from the acute care and allow the oncologist to have the acute care. And I actually feel like the clinicians will benefit as well. Getting to go to those survivorship clinics and doing survivorship clinic days, that way you can see those patients afterwards, after treatment, because sometimes we, we have seasons where we lose a lot of patients and it's really good for them to see that other side of things that, that patients can thrive and survive. And, and there is a flip side. So I think it's good for both clinicians and consumers. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone, uh, our time is up. I, I just can't thank our panel enough. Uh, would you please thank Professor Ray Chan, uh, Associate Professor Lisa Beatty, Vicky Bedford, and uh, uh, Professor Bogda Kodzwara. That was just the most, you know, 
fabulous discussion. And uh, I also want to thank all the Flinders Fearless Conversation team. You can't vis physically see them, but they're there. Matt, exercise physiologist, can you just come back on screen uh, so that we can thank Matt, uh, who's there. Hi, Matt. And I want to reassure our question askers who did get their questions asked that they're all going to be uh, noted and that the team here will be taking them on board and uh, t incorporating it into their future planning. Uh, I also want to reassure you that this has been recorded tonight and it will be available on the Flinders YouTube channel on Flinders University Fearless Conversations webpage. And as members of the newly established Fearless Network, uh, we're going to be keeping you up to date with future Fearless Conversations and other activities. Look at this, it's exactly on 7.30. I'm ABC trained, I had to stop at the top of the clock. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Everyone clapping please and good evening. <laughs>